Everybody pour yourself a glass. We are going to get started. Cheers to you all. Thank you all for coming. Can I hold up those glasses? Everything's it's Friday night. Everyone's going to have a great time tonight. So cheers to you all. Oh, welcome just, down. This, you really welcome back from summer vacation. My name is Chris McCormick from Wine 101 out here in Hamden. Tonight we're joined by Jason Kelly from Hartley and Parker here in Stratford, Connecticut, and John Maggi from VS Imports. Uh, covers all of Connecticut, a little part of New York too, right, John? No, you're not even. No, I, thankfully, I, I get to stay just in Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut's uh, enough. I like it better that way. Keep me out of keep me out of New York. Keep me out of New York right now. So tonight's discussion is uh, Italian white wines to get you through the end of summer, what we call here an Indian summer in Connecticut. And once you start getting into these wines, you'll understand that. So, what do we mean by an Indian summer, everybody? I mean. So it's a little warm, you know, it's not quite cold yet, although the nights have been really chilly. The mornings have been very cold. As I, I get up at 4.30 in the morning to go to the gym, it's very cold out. Uh, it's hoodie weather for me. But before we get into the pitch black at night, we got that nice little soothing. It's still kind of warm. Get that little chill in the air. You're putting on a campfire outside, a bonfire. You know, this is what you want to chill out with. Uh, John, what do we have lined up for tonight? Why would we pick these wines for the night? Well, thank you guys for, for having me on tonight. Um, I think we have some really cool ones lined up. I mean, Italy's wonderful because especially as we're going to see, I mean, it's a region, it's, it's a country that's known for so many different kinds of wines and everyone knows it for its reds, especially as we get into this, uh, time of the year, you know, your Brunellos, your Barolos, your Barbarescos, your Chiantis, all your sort of big cachet. Um, reds, but I mean, in Italy, they're consuming whites year round. They have whites that go well with, um, you know, autumn cuisine, more autumnal styles, ones that with a little bit more weight to them. And I think the three that we have paired out tonight actually work in all different layers for what we'll find in this sort of crossover time for the year. Because I mean, even, I mean, I'm in Bridgeport right now. Last night was a little bit warmer. It's almost even like a little humid and hot still. Um, and we've got some that work really well towards that. And then today's a little bit more brisk, a little bit more crisp. Um, you got some with a little bit more weight for it. So it's a really fun category because everyone thinks of whites in the, you know, in high summer or, you know, in the, in the middle of July sitting out in the sun. Um, but, you know, there, there should never be, you know, reds are for cold weather, whites are for warm weather. You've got beautiful warm weather reds and you've got wonderful cold weather whites. Um, they really are, you know, they're wines for all season. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we'll we'll see that tonight. Yeah, not only that, but think about all the different cuisines we're coming into this time of the year, whether you're garden or uh, just if you just change up your fall, you know, to winter menu, think about everything that you're utilizing. So right now we're coming to the end of the tomato season. I still have some out in the vines there, but making that fresh pesto as we start getting into these wines, all the different herbs I'm starting to cultivate and turn into something so I can prep them for, uh, you know, winter break. Uh, but now we're starting to get into that, you know, fall winter squash coming in, the delicata squash, uh, all the heartier vegetables coming out right now and thinking about cooking those and utilizing these wines. You're making your soup stocks as you're coming into the colder months. Uh, these are these are wines that are going to hold up to that kind of food. Uh, and again, for all of our classes, we're trying to introduce you to these wines to get you out of those stereotypical things. Especially when you think of Italy, everybody automatically, Pinot Grigio, uh, Prosecco, which are good in their own right. But there's such a, a vast, you know, a plentiful variety of Italian wines out there. Just variety, you know, between all the different varietals from the north to the south to the islands. There's so much different variation out there. That's the whole point of this. Introduce you to these varietals and see what commonalities they share with other grapes out there. And see what you like. Ultimately, it's down to what you like. Good. That's exactly it. I mean, that's it. And it, you know... I work exclusively with Italian wines, so I'm, I'm very prejudiced on this, but um, I really think Italy is one of the best uh, countries for this because, as Chris said, you have so many native varieties. You have more native varietals in Italy than any other country on earth combined. Um, so there's so much to try, so much to really sort of expand your, expand your palate and expand your selection. I mean, I've got a book here called Wine Grapes of Italy. You can see it is a thick book, and those are all the different native wine varietals of Italy. It's there's a ton to work with. If you can't find a, a white or a red from Italy that you like, then you don't like wine. That's always kind of what I say. In the movie, and, uh, just uh, just to hop, 
Go just ahead. sorry, Chris, just, not, no. just to hop in here, just to say the one, one things that I love again about these wines offering from uh, Vias Imports, you're again working with family owned properties. That's a big thing here is these are again, people that put their blood, sweat and tears in these wines and they're all family owned and they make these wines, even though they're white wines and everyone thinks it's for summer, they design these wines to be drinking year round, which I'm sure John's going to get into a little bit yeah. later, but it's just, again, great offerings of, of a family expression from each of these wines as well. Big time. I, I mean, consider that too, as we're getting into these, these aren't super mass produced wines, uh, still family, or very family oriented, which is what I like about these. And each time, I mean, the, this duo right here has been trouble all summer and trouble in a good way. When they come in with that bag, sometimes two bags, it's trouble for me because I know I'm buying either a few things or many things. And uh, <laughs> with their help though, I mean, honestly, I really want to uh, reinvigorate our Italian section and really bring in different things for uh, people to experience. And their major component in that and helping, you know, redo that section. I, I've been just pleased with everything all summer I've been drinking these. So I hope you all enjoy them as we get into them and should segue into our we appreciate first you, one. Yeah. You, we appreciate you liking them, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I, I, we, that we certainly appreciate you liking them. And uh, I can tell you, I, I've had some of these past vintages and um, these, I, I know John can definitely speak to this. These wines don't miss a beat, you know, yeah. you're, out, you're in and you're out. So this might be your first uh, year drinking them, but hopefully it's definitely not your last. And right. uh, I, I'm excited to see what next year offers with these guys as well. And I'm sure John can say the same. So Definitely. I mean, I love giving you guys the introduction of these wines um, and then hopefully sort of making you uh, lifelong lovers of all these varietals and all these styles. Uh, so I think uh, we jump into it. We'll yeah, go on to the first guy. Yeah. All right. Well, on the email I sent home, we have a tasting sheet if you want to follow along, if you printed them out. There's also maps on there uh, so you can understand where these wines are coming from. And uh, again, as, as we get into the locales, uh, we'll talk about pairings and everything, what grows together, goes together. So think about the cuisine from those individual areas that we're going to be exploring. And nine times out of 10, whatever their main cuisine is, their, their stylistic of cooking, it, it's going to work with it. Uh, especially with this first one that we're going to get into right now. So everybody pour that first glass and give it a swirl, give it a swirl, give it a smell, fill out the blanks if you want to on those sheets. Uh, we're going to walk you through the tasting as we go through it. All right. But if you have questions as we're doing it, please unmute yourself, you know, uh, raise your hand or whatever it is and ask away. All right. Yeah, Here we go. At the, at the risk of approaching stereotype, we want this to be an Italian wine tasting. We want you guys to be, you know, uh, boisterous aloud and, and definitely feel free to, to speak up and speak yeah. out. <laughs> That's um, every holiday. I do have a, Sunday here. I've got some uh, pictures, Chris. I can pop up on a share screen if you want me to do that yeah, right now. Ahead. You are you're on co-host, so. All right, beautiful. So we're going to start off with a Gavi, everybody. Gavi the uh, Gavi. Yeah. Uh, Luciana. One of my favorites. All right, guys. So you guys have the Araldica Gavi La Luciana 2018. Um, now, from a, a, a show of hands or, or course of um, how many of you guys out here have had Gavi? Is Gavi something you're familiar with? Something you've had? All right, I'm seeing some, some affirmatives out there. Uh, we tend to see Gavi as the uh, sort of the, the, the next tier up in Italian white wines. You know, everyone knows Pinot Grigio, everyone's had Pinot Grigio, and usually the next tier up from that uh, is Gavi. Uh, and part of the reason for that is Gavi's been, it's one that's done a really good job over the past few decades of making itself known in the States uh, and just in the world market. I mean, Gavi Gavi, it's short, it's simple, it's easy to say, and it's, it's one that's been around um, for a decent amount of time. So we're going up to Piemonte here. So if you guys check out on your maps, we're going to northeastern uh, or northwestern Italy, excuse me. Um, this is the region of Barolo, of Barbaresco, of the Nebbiolo varietal for red. That's really this beautifully tannic and age-worthy grape. It's always been called sort of one of the wines of kings and queens. Um, on the flip side of that, on the white side, in this little town of Gavi in the region of Alessandria, um, you have this little varietal called Cortese. Um, Cortese has been there for years and years and years, which is something you'll see with Italian grapes. Um, the first documented planting of this grape actually goes back to the year 972, um, so well over a thousand years ago. 
And we have the Catholic Church to thank for all this because the church was always uh, uh, an absolute monster at recording everything and keeping everything down. And from the, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire up till uh, the sort of the dawn of the, the, the late Middle Ages, the church was the one who kept so much winemaking culture uh, alive and well and, and kept things moving and developing. Um, so with it in, in this little area um, where you have Cortese and it's really native to this area, you won't find it anywhere else. Um, you've got right in the center of this village of God. Um, and basically what you have is within the village itself, you'll have what used to be called Gavi de Gavi. Now it's called Gavi de Community Gavi. So Gavi from the town of Gavi. Um, and then as you start going out into all these hillsides surrounding it, um, you'll have just regular Gavi DOCG. And that's what you guys have today. Um, Araldica is a, uh, it's a co-op. So it's a, it's a cooperative winery, uh, which is something you see a lot of. It's really sort of tied into Italian history because you go back to the late 40s, early 50s after the Second World War. Italy was really poor at that time. It was one of the deepest levels of poverty the country had ever been in. Um, and a lot of farmers, a lot of vineyard owners couldn't afford to produce their own wines, to bottle their own wines. So what they would do um, would set these things up called cantina sociale, a social cantina, social uh, cellar, basically. And you would have a bunch of different farmers come together, either pool their resources, pool their grapes, and have one winemaking facility, one bottling facility, um, and sell it off together. And this was something you kind of saw all around Europe um, in those days. And really, in, in other countries, it either uh, they did away with it, over the, over the rest of the 20th century, or they kind of turned it into something that's very low quality, very sort of jug wine-esque, uh, you know, sort of unmarked label stuff. Um, but Italy was really one of the only countries that kept this idea going and to actually make quality wine with it as well. Um, and where, where we are up in Piedmont is a really historic area for this kind of um, production. There's some wonderful reds made in this system and some awesome whites made. Um, so the Araldica group, is run by this guy named Claudio Manera, um, and he follows this exact principle. All the farmers are supplying their uh, grapes to him or supplying their crop and their harvest. Um, but what Claudio does that really makes a difference here, um, he's a really talented guy, an incredibly talented winemaker, and he keeps his hand in every step of the process. You know, he's going, he's visiting these guys in the vineyards, making sure they're doing the work that he wants. When the harvest comes, he's making sure the harvest is at the right time. When it gets to the winemaking style, he's instead of you know, what a lot of co-ops would do, just sort of dump everything all into one batch and make this sort of black jug wine. He's keeping things, you know, separated out into separate lots. Um, and what you have here with the La Luciana, that's actually a single vineyard. Um, and we love single vineyard. Single vineyard wines are always going to be a step up in quality because you're going to get more pure expression, a more pure quality from the wine because it's coming from one vineyard, more work went into it, uh, a little bit higher quality right. here. So what do you guys think about this wine as you taste it? Yeah, I'll mute yourselves. Call it out. Uh, share with everybody. Yeah, apple pear. All right. Light, refreshing. Yeah, it's just what it needs to be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I always think, you know, especially, um, you know, Cortese and Bobby's <laughs> work. Go ahead. Morality. Morality. Love it. A lot of minerality, yes. Yeah, Absolutely. lovely minerality to it. Really beautiful acidity. Um, that's, that's really one of the hallmarks and that's what makes, uh, I mean, we'll see that as a running theme through actually all three of the wines we'll have tonight. Um, it's a really great hallmark of Italian whites. Um, it's really what makes them such wonderful food pairing wines is that minerality and that acidity. Um, not only that, but this has some grip to it. Um, I like the comparison people make with, uh, Gavi to like Bordeaux Blanc, uh, yep. a little bit of Puy Fousse, not Puy, excuse me, Puy Fumé. It's yep. got that nice grip. It's got that nice acidity to it. Uh, it's not super weighty, but again, pay particular note to the weight of these wines as we start going up and, you know, from one wine to the next. That's why they make a great, you know, transition from summer into fall wine. They got nice weight to it. Again, with yeah. Gavi, especially this Gavi, I mean, why would anybody drink Pinot? Uh, Pinot Grigio. <laughs> actually, I mean, flat, again, there's people that do. I don't mean to crap on it like that, but uh, this got so much character to it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly it. And I always say, you know, and there's wonderful Pinot Grigios out there. I mean, that, that wine certainly built its reputation in, uh, in the world market for a very good reason. Yep. Um, 
but almost Pinot Grigio drinkers are some of my, my favorite wine drinkers to meet because once you like Pinot Grigio, there's so many wines we can expand you out to. And I think Gavi's one that one of the almost sort of gateway ones into the rest of uh, Italy because, you know, you have so many of those similar notes, the lightness, the minerality, the brightness. Um, but then, as Chris said, you've got this weight, you've got this, um, you've got this follow-up on the one. You've got this added level of complexity that just makes it great, especially as we go into the colder months. Yeah, the, the, the big thing I'm taking away from this, and, and with a lot of Bobbies that I've tasted, is, is just as Chris said, it's got a little bit more weight than a Pinot Grigio does, which I personally like, but it's not overly weighted like a California Chardonnay might be, no, no. where it's just kind of sitting in your mouth and just ripping the taste buds off your, off right. your mouth. So this is a nice balance, I think, with the two where you, you feel something's there, yeah, it's not overpowering, you know, your palate by any means. Um, and it's, it, I think the, the fruit then just explodes when you, especially on the nose, yep. uh, when you, when you smell these wines and that, that's, nice. you get a burst from the bouquet, right? When you, right. When you've kind of swirled around, I, I got the apple and the pear right away. Uh, and as I'm smelling it, it's already starting to change a little bit. So it's, it's yep. a very wine. Yeah. And as Jason said, I mean, those are two of the biggest tasting notes on Gavi's in general is that, that apple, that pear, all these orchard fruits. Um, these sort of white floral sounds, these orchard fruits that, that, that added weight in the back. Um, I mean, as we start to talk into food pairings, when you're up in Piemonte, I mean, guys, this is an area that is not what you think of your sort of, uh, you know, Italian tomato based um, pastas and lighter meat. This is, this is the mountains. This is northern Italy. This is uh, a lot of mushrooms, a lot of cow's milk cheeses, a lot of... Um, in this particular part of Piedmont, um, you'll find a lot of veal, um, a lot of beef, um, a lot of lamb as well. Um, and this is an area, so you're, you're really getting into that risotto is very common here, very popular here. You're getting into that sort of weightier, uh, more autumnal winter style foods. And you want a white that's got a little bit of, uh, a little bit of heft behind it, a little bit of weight behind it, but still light enough to cut through all that stuff. John, I think you brought up risotto because we were talking about risotto. Now you got me through. We were, we were Jason and I <laughs> gra were grabbing dinner and just talking nonstop about food and risotto the whole time. And that, that'll be, that'll be the next video will be, will be uh, Jason's, Jason's first risotto making class because he's very excited to try making it. I could see this guy with a little bit of pumpkin risotto. How about that? There you go. Look at that. That, that is there, is there any more perfect blend of New England and Italy in one, in one, uh, <laughs> Ladies and gents, what would you pair? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking pumpkin risotto. But again, I could be wrong. Say whoever, if, if oh, just I agree. Your just your comments. If you think I'm yeah. wrong, let me put it in the <laughs> put it in the comment section or unmute yourself. If you're, a, you know, if you like to cook at home, what would you pair with this? I mean, I'm still thinking uh, fresh pesto out of the garden, considering where this comes oh, from. Um, yeah. I mean, within this region, this is closer to the uh, Ligurian border, correct? Yeah, this is this is definitely this is southern Piedmont. Um, so you're getting close to Liguria. You're hitting those hills as you get down to the uh, the Ligurian Sea. Yeah. I wonder if uh, I wonder if a little bit of uh, this might be too much of the apple, but a little bit of apple salad with the cranberry and gorgonzola. I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, you could definitely do that. In the apples, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is also, guys. This is just a wine that still works really well as an aperitif. Um, because it is, it, it's still so light on its feet and it's got enough of that, um, that sort of, you know, delicate perfume tone. It does work really well. Somebody's commenting mushroom chestnut risotto. Uh, oh, come on. That's, that's, that's perfect. perfect. Are you you're, not, you're, you're not getting yeah, any better. I was making Just that. tell me where to drive. <laughs> yeah. Tell me where, tell us both where we go. We'll bring the wine for that. That's absolutely delicious. I would go for yeah. that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Very good. That's, um, that's outstanding. So the label, it's not necessarily a label change, but. Uh, when you look at this label, it does say uh, Gavi from the commune of Gavi. Uh, instead of people always, what's Gavi the Gavi? What's, how's that compared to just Gavi? Uh, a lot of confusion as to what comes from where and where is this. Labels are a big confusing point with a lot of people. And it's understandable, especially if you don't know what anything is, if it's not spelled out for you, if the varietal's not yeah. actually labeled on there. Uh, so is that something that they're trying to like narrow down or really help people understand as far as what these wines are, where they come from, and, you know, the whole. We're, we're, we're hitting a really good point in, in time for uh, Italian wines because Italians are finally understanding the concept that we like to learn things from labels and we like things to be actually relatively clear. And Italians 
used to love making wines that are very complicated and the labels do not make sense. It, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful, I work for an Italian company, so I can tell you this firsthand. It is a wonderful culture. Um, but in terms of, you know, they're, we're, we're, they're not German. We're not keeping things, uh, uh, clear cut and, and sort of leveled out. But I think, um, I think Araldica has done a really wonderful job, um, yeah. with their label of making things a little bit more simple and, and making things a little bit more, um, easy to understand, um, on it, which I think is great. And, and I think the, the idea of changing the name from Gavi to Gavi, even though that rolled off the tongue a little more to Gavi, the Comune de Gavi, um, it makes sense in a more literal sense because it, instead of saying, you know, when people say it in, in, you know, in the States, we're so used to looking at a wine, you know, a wine from California says Cabernet on it. It's made out of Cabernet. That is what it is. Um, but a European wine will be Puitrusets, from Puitrusets, made from Chardonnay, um, a Gavi. It's made of Cortese, but it's from Gavi. So saying Gavi from the town of Gavi does do a little bit of a better uh, explanation there. And it kind of helps bring, break that down a little bit uh, more for the average consumer. Right. And as we're looking at it again, uh, DO, this is a DOCG. So this is held to higher standards than anything, correct? Yeah, this is held to the highest standards that Italian winemaking can be held to. DOCG is the top of the pyramid um, for Italian wine quality. And you'll see that with you'll see that with two of the wines we have tonight. Right, right. So again, okay. the comments or if you want to unmute yourself, let us know what you're thinking about the wine. Um, Big Big shout out to Mr. Downhour, by the way. I saw he's in the chat box. That's my high school history teacher. Uh, the best history teacher I've ever had, as a matter of fact. So, uh, all right. So Tell us all of Jason's grades. How is he as a student? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mr. Downhour, please don't tell them about my high school uh, routine. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, an <laughs> awesome history teacher. Shout out, Mr. Downhour. It's good to see you. <laughs> all right. About Hello, 2018. <laughs> this line is from 2018. Was that like a good year? I mean, 18 was, 18 was, uh, it was, you know, it was a gr good all around year, you know, in, in vintages, you have these, uh, you have these sort of amazing sort of back and forth of just for instance, 2016, um, which is what you're seeing a lot of the reds from this region come out right now was outstanding. 16 was one of those years that everyone loved. Everyone went gaga for it was warm in the summertime, but cool at night to preserve acidity. The summer finished right on time. The harvest was right on time. You go on to 2017. Uh, 2017 was sort of a disaster. It was triple digit hot the whole time up there. Um, and it was actually so hot, a lot of people lost production because they had to either uh, trim their vines too much, the, the grapes can bur get burned, they get raisined on the vine. Um, but then what you got from the grapes you were able to have, if you say you only had 40% left of your harvest, it was a very good harvest for that 40%. Uh, 2018 was basically, it was a great year. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that everyone started writing it down in the history books and going, this is the year, this is the, the vintage of the century. And we'll, you know, our, our grandchildren will talk about this, but it was great. The weather was good. It worked. The harvest was great. The wines were excellent. They're great wines to drink now, especially for the whites. Um, you know, they're great ones to consume now. They had everything that, the, uh, that you could want as a winemaker and as a wine importer and a wine vendor to sell. Um, so it, it worked really well. And, and you need those years uh, because, you know, we, we'd love to have a vintage of the century. That's sort of the joke in the wine industry is there's, you know, there's a vintage of the decade every four years, you know. Um, but, the, the, you know, vintages like 2018, um, they're, they're just great all around years. And they're, they're, they're ones that everyone's happy with. No one has a problem about it. And that's, and that's always really nice to see. Yeah. Even in the off vintages, <laughs> I, I encourage people to try those uh, and see what you think of those. I can remember going, I, just because Jason's here, going to a Hartley and Parker tasting, you know, trade tasting. And that year, everybody was complaining about the 2016 vintage of Sancerre and how bad it was going to be and this and that. But when we actually talked to the producers right from there saying, hey, uh, you're showing me 2016, what do you think? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the media is telling everybody. He goes, it depends where you are in Sancerre. He goes, wherever his vineyard was situated, he goes, we didn't get affected by the hail. He goes, you can't generalize and say 2016 was horrible for all of Sancerre. 
it's 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 not you know practical to say that he goes because there were some of us that did very well and yeah others got whacked really hard with the hail and it made for a bad crop he goes but he goes just you know and you start tasting his wines he's like what do you think it's, it's spot on you know that bright minerality uh but again like john was saying you know keep in mind you know if it is an off vintage uh try to find some of those gems within those off vintages because even you know we've had this conversation a few weeks ago within bad vintages there's some really great value to find especially if you really enjoy it and start exploring that you know really ask around ask the person selling it to you or the restaurant that's presenting it to you if they've had it and how it differed from previous vintages uh like yeah. i said with these guys i'm trying we try to taste consistently with them to see how everything varies especially if we're moving along stuff with them um and if there's a variation we make note of it you know that way when you come to us we let you know that you know what this one isn't super acidic like the last one you know but it's still quite enjoyable yeah but, and that that's really one of the fun things about um about wine and you know about, about our jobs is uh, just about enjoying wine is you know wine shouldn't taste the same year to year they're they're an agricultural product they're uh you know they're based on the harvest if it's tasting same year in and year out over the past five years and then you've got something wrong you've got something wrong with it yeah. uh you know um wine should be wine, wine should be different it's it's a it's sort of a it's a living thing it's you know there, there's or you know it's bioorganisms in the wine creating wine yeah. it should be different um from year to year to year um but you know I, as chris said you know always talk to people and ask about the vintages because it's so easy to to make overarching um, overarching statements, and it's and especially when it's things like weather, it really can be. You know, if it if it hailed, well, it hit that guy. It didn't hit me, so my wines are fine, even though everyone says it's a it's a bad vintage. It really, you know, in in one way, it's the the vintage thing starts to make things simple, then it makes things incredibly complicated because then you have to keep diving back into it um, again. But the best thing to do is if you find a wine you like. Um, you know, have, have faith in it, ask, you know, ask uh, guys like Chris, ask the store, because it's always better to trust in the producer first um, and the vintage right. second, because if, if they're a good winemaker, if they're a good uh, viticulturalist, they know how to make good wine right. um, in a year that can be difficult. Right. And to, just to my final, the one thing I want to add with that as well is this, this wine might have tasted a little even slightly different when we pulled it earlier this year. I mean, when you take mm -hmm. single vineyard yeah. wine like this, hand harvested wines like this, they're going to evolve in the bottle even with okay. a year's time so even something like this where it's 2018 it is super fresh it's super ripe uh what you tasted maybe in may might change from what you're tasting now in september if you were to pick these bottles up at both those times right. but that's the beauty of a single vineyard wine is that it's 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 almost like a human being where it's it's changing throughout its course in the bottle which is super cool yep. great all right Let's uh, venture off the mainland. We're going to head over to one of the islands. Um, right. All right. This is yeah, going to get a second bottle of Vermentino. There's a lot my, going on it's here. It's like John. my go to summer wine. I do a lot of fish at home. Uh, this is my go to, especially this past summer. Uh, when I asked John, you know, do you have a Vermentino? He's like, absolutely. And, you know, we got into that uh, just because I was on the hunt as soon as Memorial Day passed. I'm on the hunt for something crisp and, you know, with a ton of salinity. Uh, but get into this because Vimertino is an interesting grape. Uh, it does grow in other areas of the world, uh, just other areas of Italy itself, and how it differs from the island to the mainland. Uh, different stylistic, you know, approach to everything uh, with consideration of terroir. But when you go over to France, uh, Vimertino plays a huge role, especially we're coming out of rose season, but Provence rose, it's one of the blending grapes involved in that. It's called uh, Roy uh, in Provence. Uh, but again, it's different everywhere you go. You can't just generalize and say, this is what it tastes like. Consider where these wines come from uh, and what's, what's the terroir they're grown in, uh, especially when you get into the islands that we're going to taste now with, John. Yeah, I mean, as Chris said, this wine for me is one of the most, this grape is one of the most fun examples of um, just how to get into uh, wine being different, where it is the study of terroir, a study of really sort of the history of uh, European wine, because as he said, 
It's, uh, you'll see it all over the world, all over the Mediterranean, because it really is a Mediterranean varietal. You know, the, the jury's out on whether it's indigenously Italian, indigenously French, indigenously Spanish, or indigenously Sard um, Sardinian, as we'll see. And it's got different names everywhere it's planted in, Vermin in uh, Sardinia and in Tuscany, it's called Vermentino. Um, in Liguria, it's called Pigato. In Piedmont, where we just were with the Gavi, there's some plantings of it called Favorita. Um, and as he said, in France, it's called Roll. It's incredibly confusing, and this is sort of really one of the wonderful things um, about wine because you, it really sort of you start talking about this, and it really takes you back to you know a thousand years ago when people were trading all across the Mediterranean. When you're talking about the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Greeks, and when people are trading, they're bringing grapevines with them from here to there, and planting them here, and colonizing here, and moving here. Um, and these wines and these varietals move all over the Mediterranean and all over Europe. Yeah, um, just be, just what you just said, uh, put a little note in that. Uh, wine should bring you back. These, I mean, especially if you've been to Italy, these wines should bring you back there. And that's, uh, you know, I let you, you touched on that just a little bit, but, uh, and we talked about this before we hit, open it up to the class. When you're sipping on this, you know, we we're talking about uh, Frascati. And that should bring you back to, uh, you know, an outdoor trattoria in Rome, you know, out there in the square, just sipping away, you know, during the summer. But uh, exactly. Yeah. It's you know? bring you back to that place. And that's the whole thing with wines, especially with, with John and Jason break to me. They, they give you a sense of place where these things come from and start to identify that place of origin with these wines. Uh, yeah, you want them to be a snapshot of where they're from, and that's one of the cool things about this wine, because it's a snapshot of, to me, one of the most interesting parts of Italy. Um, so you guys looking on your map, I mean, you're looking off the west coast of Italy um, to the island of Sardinia. Sardinia is totally, you know, the, the joke is with Italy that it's not one country, it's, you know, it's 20 different regions combined by a more or less similar government uh, and a natural mistrust of each other, but... Uh, Sardinia is an island completely, completely unto itself. Um, it's, it's incredibly, uh, it's its own indigenous land. The people of Sardinia are genetically different than the rest of the people of Europe. They're almost, they're more closely related to the Basque people of northern Spain. Um, these sort of, these populations that were here before uh, the rest of the people peopled Europe, essentially. Their language is the closest thing we have to um, Latin to this day. Um, just take, for example, Ita I mean, Italian, you would think, is sort of the closest thing to Latin, but the Sardinian language um, shares about 20% more uh, of its language with Latin than anything else. So you'll still see S's here, U's here. When you look at Sardinian written down, you really see sort of the last vestiges um, of the of really like the Roman Empire here. Um, it's this, it's this very, very interesting region. Um, so where we're going here, we're going to the province of Sassari. Um, so if you're looking on the map at a picture of Sardinia, you're going to the Northwest corner, um, right along the Northern shore here. If you guys look at this picture, that's a picture from the Crabioni vineyards. Um, these vines are less than a hundred meters from the water. This is as, uh, seaside as salinity driven as uh, sort of uh, beachy wine as you can find really I mean this is this is absolutely what I think of when I think of uh, oceanside uh, you know seafood driven wine yeah. um, but it really ties into the into the culture so the name Murage that you'll find here uh, that little picture off to the left is these little stone towers these dry stone towers that are called Murages um, they've been there for thousands and thousands of years. Those towers predate the Roman Empire, um, and they all over the hillsides of Sardinia. Sardinia is, there's not a lot going on in Sardinia. You know, you have little villages um, full of people that live well above 100 years old. It was the first blue zone um, in the world, actually. So it's got the highest number of centurions um, in any other part of the world. Um, and it's this really ancient area, but you'll have Vermentino planted all over there. And these guys took the name of their winery from that. Um, but this one to me, guys, this is all about, you know, days like we had yesterday that were still sunny and hot and warm and beautiful September days. This is the time when you go, you know, you go out to eat somewhere like Shell and Bones in downtown New Haven or someplace on the water. You order, if you want to, you know, if you want to go nuts and get a seafood tower, you do it. But otherwise, you get a dozen oysters on the half shell. Um, you get, you know, shrimp cocktail. You get some kind of seafood dish. And you jump into this Vermentino. 
um, because this is as seafood driven and as absolutely wonderful and salty and bright and mineral as you could want for a wine for myself. Yeah, this is, a, I love Vermentino in the summertime. I love it anytime, but just like you're talking about. So when you're looking at that picture, as close to the water it is, I always use the comparison with uh, Albarino from Spain. So the yeah. closer to the water, Rioche Bias, that the vineyards are, you get that uh, tremendous amount of uh, salinity to it. And for those that drink Albarino, you'll notice that. But as you come more inland, they get more weighty. Uh, so the difference between this compared to like a Vermentino from uh, Tuscany, uh, it's gonna have that weighty component to it, less of that salinity. You get, I almost get more floral notes out of a Tuscan one. Yeah, definitely. To me, T Tuscan Vermentino, even though it's really not that far away when you're looking at it in just terms of uh, distance, you know, it's, it's, you're talking almost uh, Connecticut to Long Island, maybe, you know, slightly greater distance. Um, but the style is completely different. Tuscan Vermentinos are fatter, they're rounder, they're, as you said, the more floral and perfumed. Um, and here, the ones from Sardinia totally just speak of the sea. They're just completely mineral, they're completely salty and, and bright and wonderful. Um, and they're, they're awesome summer wines, but something to think about as you go into the fall. Um, or even if we, if we really project ahead, yeah. you know, we talk about getting close to the holidays. If anyone here is uh, Italian, then you're naturally only going to be consuming fish on Christmas Eve. And if you're <laughs> only consuming fish on Christmas Eve, there's no reason why you shouldn't be consuming a Vermentino di Sardinia because that'll go well with anything you got. <laughs> and John, just to relate to uh, one of the other wines that you, you sell as well, that the, the Brumi Vermentino, for example, is a yeah. completely different beast right. than this, yeah. uh, which is a, is a Tuscan Vermentino. And that like just screams pineapple and ripeness, but it also has some, some nice weight to it where this is a complete change up. This I'm getting way more herbal essence. I'm almost getting like green bell pepper, which is uh, completely in, a, in an awesome way, but you're also getting the salinity and you're getting the, the bright fruit that you're looking for with Vermentino. So it just it's awesome to see the difference of the same yeah. grape in different areas, not so far from each other. In, in yeah. Okay. yeah, and you can have two completely, two types that are completely different, but both fantastic, you know? Right. right. And You've really right. Got, got whatever whatever you're in the mood for. Um, Vermentino can really deliver on that um, for, for a white, which is one of the fun things. It's really this, this it's a multi-purpose uh, grape. Right, it's like going to a toolbox. I mean, you're working on a project, in this case, preparing a meal. What can you go, what do you have in your toolbox that, that will handle that? How can you fix this? How can you complement this? How can you make it better, you know, or enhance either or, you know, the meal enhances the wine, the wine enhances the meal. Uh, and again, I keep reiterating this to everybody, keep that in mind, because there's just not, it's just not that one fix all for everything. You know, one Chardonnay doesn't encompass everything. Uh, one Vermentino does not, you know, there's a rhyme and reason to why we, taste constantly to try to work different pairings out and come up with all these different concoctions. Uh, we're talking about uh, Christmas Eve, the night of the fishes and, you know, doing this with like cod, uh, anything nice yep. really. Um, oh yeah. That acidity, that salinity cuts right through it. You know, if my mother's doing her, you know, uh, crab legs that night, I think this is a delicate enough to get through the crab. This is yeah. a spectacular wine. Yeah. If, I, if, I were to, if I were to pair this with some food or with some fish, I yeah. wouldn't do much with the fish. I tell you, I would let the fish just salt and pepper, a little bit of oil even maybe, or some nice piece of fish, and just let the wine do the, almost like pairing with the fish. Yeah, you know? down in the comment section, our friend Paola uh, says Bronzino. There you go. That's, that's, that's perfect for this. Yeah. So Paola runs a – Paola does wine – uh, not just wine tours. Paola does uh, private tours to Italy uh, on the Amo Travel. So, I mean, she's – Oh, fantastic. Heavily within, you know, between north and south of uh, Italy. He's in there constantly. No, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, well, now you have to get a tour of the islands in Paolo. Yeah. You've got to get uh, Sardinia and Sicily. Yeah. Right, yeah. we got to get back out there. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, guys, what do, you, what do you think of this wine? What would anyone, anyone in the crowd want to, you know, want to have alongside this? What do you think of it? Do you uh, give me some opinions? Yeah, you know what? I, I've been reached out. I, several people have reached out to me over the past couple of months. How do we get more into wine? We want to understand. It's just it's just doing what we're doing now. We're having casual conversation about this. Uh, again, the three of us are heavily in the industry, uh, but it, it's 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 for everybody, and it's it's our job to bring you all into this world. Uh, but get out there, sample, have casual conversation with it. You're never wrong with what you're tasting. Uh, we could we could 
it's like tra we're like training wheels. Uh, we try to keep you on track. If you do taste something off, we want to know about it and we'll help you understand it better and, you know, become a better taster and realize, you know, what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, it, it comes down to what would you like to drink you know, or eat with this? Uh, what do you like about this? And the, the opposite of that, what don't you like about this? And it helps us narrow down better wines for you. Yeah, Peter, fruity nose, rich structure, good acidity. Yeah, stands up to a lot of food. Absolutely. Yeah, good with the Asiago. Yeah, Asiago's got that little pungency to it. But when you get good age Asiago, you get that saltiness in it. This got this has its own solidity to it, and it matches right up with it. Yeah, good choice. Yeah, especially. I mean, just question. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. Yes. Question. go for it. Um, you know, it looks like this vineyard is very close to the sea. Does that affect the flavor of the grape? Um, it does. So, what something that you'll see um, a lot of times when you have seaside vineyards, uh, not just in Italy, but really in any any part of the world, as Chris said, also in, uh, in northern Spain with stuff like Albarino, um, is that vineyards will pull a lot um, from the breeze. Because on one hand, you've got this salty maritime breeze coming in all the time um, that's always going to affect the flavor of the grapes. It's going to impart this little salinity to it, uh, this added minerality. Um, and then that's always going to preserve the acidity too, because the cold, uh, the colder breezes coming in off the water at night uh, preserve the acidity to keep the grapes cool at night, and that kicks up the acidity a little bit, keeps them brighter. Um, especially when you have things so close to the water, um, you know, like here in Sardinia um, or in other parts of Italy, the closer the water you get, you can always tell. Even if you go to Greece with something uh, like a, a white from Santorini right. um, or the Spanish whites. There's this sort of uh, saline mineral hallmark to seaside wines that rings true anywhere you go in the world where they're planted close to the water. It's, it's yeah. this beautiful sort of uh, this this sort of like aquatic terroir. Yeah. Um, but they okay. no. Nice fresh briny. Yep. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened in that room. <laughs> Yeah, scallops. Yeah, scallops would be great with this. Again, something briny. Uh, clams on the half. I mean, you could get away with it. Yeah. Uh, briny, a little, a little oily. Uh, yeah, with great acidity, something oily really pairs well with that. Cuts right through the uh, the fat and that the oiliness and it, it works great. Uh, Ferretino does get certain areas of uh, Sardinia does garner a DOCG and a superior status. Correct. Yeah, so a little bit to the east of here, um, you'll have uh, Galura, which is actually considered to be one of the homes of Vermentino. It's, it's you know, the, the ampelographers, the people who study the DNA of grapes. Um, that's sort of one of the theories is that's where Vermentino is from, um, although that's never been sort of, there's, there's no, you know, uh, final written in stone consensus on that. Um, so you'll have these areas, and that, that area you'll see, the vineyards there are a little bit uh, higher altitude. The soil is a little bit stonier. You'll pull a little bit more minerality, a little bit more added complexity to the wines there. Um, but the entire island of Sardinia um, is, is a DOC for Vermentino di Sardinia. So anywhere you go on Sicily, you can plant Vermentino and produce a Vermentino di Sardinia. Um, but you do have those areas that are a little bit uh, higher tier. These guys actually produce a superior as well. It doesn't come to the... Uh, doesn't come to the state, unfortunately, um, but it is one that's a little bit sort of, it, it's amped up a notch, you know, it's it, the alcohol is a little bit higher, uh, it's a little bit deeper, a little bit richer, a little bit more intense, um, and it's also a very cool expression, but I do still happen to love this this straight bottling. Um, do they get into any oak aging with the Vermentino, or they just leave it pure, crisp like that, unadulterated? Not with the one we're tasting tonight. This is just stainless steel and concrete to keep it as pure and fresh as you can get. Um, and then they do some uh, that they keep in Italy, actually. These guys make a, a few different things in Italy um, that they that they throw a little oak on. They actually make a, uh, a champagne method Vermentino that they don't sell outside of Italy. Um, that if anyone, you know, one day when we can someday go to Italy again, um, I definitely recommend anyone trying if they have the ability to, because I've never tried it and I've got my sights on it for when I'm able to. Wow. That sounds I'm able to over there and try it. Wow. But That's crazy. Italians love sparkling wine. And any, this is always really one of the cool things is we see almost none of it. Um, but anywhere you go in Italy, if anyone's one day on a, on a tour, if you go to a winery that's producing a white wine, there's a 
probably 85% chance they make a sparkling wine out of it too because Italians love their bubbles. But I love bubbles. John, how long has this winery been doing this, would you say? Have they been, are they one of the, the, you know, the oldest in this area? How long would you say they've been kind of, uh, you know, doing this on the property? They're actually not super old. Um, there have been vineyards here for uh, years and years and years, um, you know, well over a century. There's, this area has been um, farmed for, for vineyards. Um, but this particular winery, Naraga Cabione, is only about 25 years old. But that actually brings it into a really cool um, traditional aspect that these guys do. So they do they practice something which is really old Sardinian um, tradition, and it's called the Vendemia delle Donne, which is the the, the women's harvest, but, um, the harvest by the women, and that kind of taps into this um, this old school practice in Sardinia, where traditionally the men would be out either on um, fishing boats or trading or basically out across the Mediterranean. And the women would be home running the household. Um, they'd be, and but they'd also be running the agriculture. They'd be, they'd be controlling the harvest. They'd be controlling all the uh, the produce um, produced. So uh, arguably, the the more important job because they're they're keeping the food production up and they're keeping uh, money flowing in and production going. Um, and to this day, Nuraga Crabioni still practices. Um, that so any uh, any women out there in the crowd tonight when Italy eventually does open um, If you ever find yourselves in Sardinia, you can go to uh, Nuraga Crabioni uh, and you can take part in the harvest because it is run entirely 100% by women and only women are invited and women from around the world uh, Are invited to go they take anyone uh, walking on they're happy to have you be a part of the harvest and take part so you can have that, that beautiful harvest right next to the uh you know less than 100 meters from the water uh, these these wonderfully stylized newspapers are uh talking about the vendemia de la donne from back in the 20s they're written in sardinian so if anyone can translate that i will <laughs> i will venmo you an undisclosed amount of money because <laughs> <laughs> That's a language all in a, unto itself, correct? I mean, the dialect. It's totally a language right? all yeah. unto itself. It is, it is, you know, it is, I, I won't even say dialect because it's not a dialect. It's a language. Wow. Yeah. Uh, General, I used to work with went over there for his honeymoon and he's like, it's vastly different from the mainland. He's like, everybody here is like five feet tall. I feel like a giant here. Uh, <laughs> you know, but like John said, everybody lives to be like a hundred. Uh, so when you talk about the red wines and everybody talks about, uh, you know, the benefits of red wines and all this, uh, they're kind of now is one of the, one of those red wines that are the highest in antioxidants. And when Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz, one of those guys talked about it, I, I mean, I've never seen so many people rush out just to buy this fountain of youth in a bottle from Sardinia, uh, just because it, just the health benefits. I'm like, yeah, I guess. I mean, if they're living to a hundred, but then again, most Italians over there live a long life, healthy life. I mean, last time I was there was many years ago, but uh, I got passed by a woman smoking a cigarette with a cane going up a hill. I'm like, this is the life. Look at me. I'm sucking. <laughs> this, this, there's something good going on out here. So, yeah. The truth in that. Awesome. Yeah. Good. What does everybody think of this? Very different, but you can find a lot of commonalities with this wine with many other wines. Uh, again, we've mentioned a bunch of them tonight, but this is uh, the heart and soul. This comes from, this is from Sardinia. Um, yeah. And, and as Chris said, if you guys ever want to uh, try the, you know, try a native Sardinian red, um, he has the Cannonel from these guys as well. And it is, it's, you know, it, the two wines represent Sardinia beautifully because this represents the seaside of Sardinia and all that, the, those beautiful coastlines. And the Cannonau represents the sort of the wild, scrubby hillands. It's really rustic, um, intense sort of uh, red, but still low alcohol, still awesome. It sort of makes you uh, think of having, you know, a, a roast rack of lamb yeah. sort of thing. So it's, it's the, uh, and and by, by Dr. Oz's word, it's one of the healthiest reds you can have, so. Got so, it for, it. for those that don't know, Cananao is the local name for Grenache out there. Yep. Uh, so if you like Grenache, um, this is very different than the uh, Spanish version where it, it's not super fruit forward. Uh, this has a lot of common uh, uh, characteristics of like Rhone style Grenache. It's a little gnarly sometimes, a uh, little brambly fruit on it. Uh, it it's very rustic. I love it. it it's, it's that very different style. Uh, but they also grow Carignano. 
Uh, it's one of nope. their other grapes. It's very different. If you like a lot of minerality to it for, in a red, uh, fantastic. Uh, it's like one of those untouched countries that we don't get to really look at a lot uh, when everybody's so focused on the mainland, Chianti, Sangiovese. But as soon as you get out to the island, and these guys are great with that, showcasing wines like that for me, uh, it's a whole different category, you know. And uh, again, you just got to realize where you are. You're on this island. It's very secluded from a lot of different things. Uh, but what yeah. does everybody think? Make a comment in the section in the chat room down there or unmute yourself. You've got something to add to. If you've been to Sardinia, add something to this. Uh, I live vicariously through everybody that I don't get to go on vacation so much. But, uh, you know, I love to hear stories. Again, when Paolo comes into the store and does her chat, you see all these beautiful pictures of the country. It's like, oh, you know, you just want to hop on that plane right now and get over there as fast as you can. Even drinking these wines, talking to these guys about it, you want to just get right over there and drink and eat away with everybody and live the life, la bella vita, you know? Exactly. This gives us sort of the, uh, the, the window into there until, until anyone can go back there. Right. <laughs> Excellent. So we're going back to the mainland now. We're going to head over the pond right into Tuscany. Uh, yeah. The next wine, uh, which yeah. is, again, you're talking about uh, Gavi being indigenous to that region in uh, Pimonte. Uh, we're going right to Varnaccia, which is uh, it's just classic Tuscany, no? Yeah, this is this is uh, sort of the, the quintessential uh, Tuscan white, and you know this is probably one of the regions that we really don't think of whites from um, okay. right. for Tuscany. I mean, this is guys, this is your region of Chianti, uh, Brunello di Montalcino, Brunellino di uh, Moralino di Scanzano, um, Super Tuscan Carmignano. You have all these wonderful, wonderful appellations um, of red production. Uh, in Tuscany, Sangiovese is king here. It's the the number one grape in Italy, and and in no place does it have higher prestige and higher uh, and a higher sort of population than Tuscany. All that being said, uh, Vernaccia di San Gimignano is really uh, one of the outstanding whites that Italy produces. It was the first uh, DOCG white wine in Italy. It was the first one to receive uh, sort of recognition both within the country for the laws and international recognition. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a, a wonderful wine. Uh, so this comes from uh, La Lastra. These guys are located just outside Siena, the, around the village of San Gimignano, um, which is really one of these classic um, old school Tuscan hilltop villages with the beautiful clock tower in the medieval city. Um, it's incredibly picturesque here. Um, Typically, what uh, you know from the store where I used to work, I'm sure Chris will say the same thing. We used to get a lot of requests for these wines from people who had visited Tuscany uh, and been to this particular area, and they'd had the wine there, and they'd come back saying, "Oh, do you have this uh, this wine I had? It was called Vernaccia, and yep, Vernaccia di San Gimignano." Um, so this is the the first wine of the night, the only wine that's not 100% one varietal. It's only 98% one varietal. Uh, it's a 98% Vernaccia. Then you have this uh, tiny little 2% of a grape called Trebbiano, um, which is a really high production varietal that you'll, you'll find planted all over Italy and in Tuscany as well. Um, and this really, really cool little grape called Malvasia Bianca Lungo del Chianti, um, which up until uh, only really a couple decades ago was one of the major grapes of Chianti. So Chianti um, from the 1700s, when, when it was basically invented, the recipe for Chianti was invented, until sort of the, the late 70s, um, it had to, by law, have a white grape in it, um, the Malvasia Bianca. Um, then they started uh, taking it out, and today Chianti is usually uh, all red varietals, unless you're a super old school producer. Um, these guys, so the, the winemaker here, his name is Renato Spano. Um, these guys are a biodynamic winery, um, and if you guys have heard that term before or had biodynamic wines before, um, you may know them as being sort of, uh, you know, organics on steroids, you know, whereas organic wineries, organic production is, you know, focused on doing all the right things in the vineyard and um, you know, not using pesticides, not using any kind of chemicals in the wine. Biodynamics takes that and goes completely nuts with it. Here we're talking about phases of the moon. We're talking about, um, you know, re, you know, paying attention to the soil, but going by uh, the sort of day it is, by uh, this really sort of all-encompassing idea that it's a little uh, 
sort of that the world is connected and everything is a part of something else. Um, you know, you, you try not to sound like uh, you're going into real hippie territory when you talk about it, but the concept of biodynamics has been around since the early 1900s, so it predates hippies by years and years and years. So that weird little picture we have in the bottom right um, is one of my favorite uh, traditions in biodynamics because I just think it's so crazy. So that is um, basically burying um, bullhorns in the vineyard um, and they're full of manure, full fertilizer. Uh, there's a lot of reasons on, on, on why this is, and you can take it as, uh, as sort of out there, as, you, as sort of high concept as you want, high philosophy as you want, where by filling the horn with manure and planting it in the vineyard, you're bringing everything into harmony with itself and you're bringing the, uh, you're bringing the pastoral uh, identity of the vineyard into identity with the agricultural uh, element and you're bringing it all together and all into one. Um, but the, and then at the end of the season, you're uh, just before harvest, you're digging it up and um, basically making a fertilizer out of it and spraying it all over the vines. Mm -hmm. um, the realistic part of that and the, the, the part of that that gets more down to the details for, um, for guys like me, for guys like Chris, for guys like Jason, is that what you're ending up with is a really, really high quality fertilizer. Um, the silica dust that they're mixing in um, through the fertilizer before they pack it in the horn when they're spraying that over the grapes, protects it from the sunlight a little bit. It's refracting some of the sunlight off of it. Um, and to me, that's that's really the point of biodynamics is, you know, you can go into these things like taking into account phases of the moon and only, you know, only harvesting from this vine on a waxing moon on the third Monday of February. But what that means at the end of the day is you're spending a lot of time in the vineyard. You're spending a lot of time paying attention. And that's the important part. Whether or not you hold credence with the idea that you know uh, a, a grape picked on the full moon will you know be twice its size in, in the harvest um, if you're spending that much time paying attention then you are spending a lot of time with your vines and taking very very good care of them and that's what these guys do right it's not just hippie stuff it's it's really just what john's saying it's paying attention to your vineyards letting the vineyard talk to you you're 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 out there you're vested into that to that property uh, and just, just really tending to everything. Uh, I equate it to, uh, we had conversations about this, you know, old Italian just sitting in his garden, little 10 by 10 garden, really pruning the tomato vines, you know, touching the soil, really understanding what's going on with everything. Uh, and then covering everything when it's, you know, the weather report said it's gonna get bad and, you know, it, it comes down to all yeah. that, but just really on top of vineyard control over there. What yeah. I love about, oh, sorry, John. Uh, just no, go for it. Yeah, what I love about this this type of, of style or the uh, the ideology of doing something like this is that it really just brings everything full circle, as John said, because you're really getting the organic practices of all of these winemakers, and you're really still getting the true sense of place when they do something like okay. this. And a lot of these big, you know, big brands that people might be buying in these big box stores have a lot of pesticides, have a lot of artificial things going on in the wines, whereas this is bringing it back to the old school way of doing things and really the, the clean way of doing things, I guess is the right way to say it, um, of, of doing these wines. And, and then that's how you get the true expression of not only the soil, but also the grapes. And that gives the grapes the best chances to grow, which is where you're getting it from these, you know, this type of, uh, of process, which is, which is awesome to see. Right. I mean, to, to really sort of tie into it, you know, I, you see all the time, uh, you know, people who are shopping at Whole Foods, shopping at farmer's markets. If you're having a garden in your backyard, you want to be an organic garden, you're really, really conscious of um, the kind of food you're buying, the kind of produce you're buying, and you want to make sure it's organic. Um, you know, and then to, buy, then to go into a liquor store and buy a bottle of wine from sort of a big box producer, you're essentially not, not negating that, but you're ignoring the same practices that you're choosing with for your food. Because wine is, wine is an agricultural product, the same thing as, as you know, any of the vegetables or produce that you're gonna buy uh, in Whole Foods. And the same theory should hold sense and should, should be followed. If you're gonna buy organic food, you're gonna buy organic produce, um, then you should be going for smaller production, uh, more sort of uh, intensely cared for organic or biodynamic wines. No, true to that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. 
there's a whole thing, especially uh, especially now in the wine world, this clean natural wine movement, and there's there's no real definition of that. Uh, to have a wine that is totally 100% sulfite free, your wine would be dead. Uh, yeah. And you, you talk to winemakers and they roll their eyes. I had a conversation with uh, one of my other salespeople about natural wines. And I mean, he was on that phone like a hotline. I got to talk to you right now. I got to talk to you right now. And you can read blogs and podcasts. And there's there's really no definition of that that clearly defines what a natural wine should be there's no criteria that it should fall in. Uh, but when you're tasting something like this just as we touched on before there's a lot of there's a lot of hands-on in the vineyard uh, I had a conversation with somebody this morning at the gym they're talking about wines and it gives you a headache it's like well you're just drinking bad wine I mean it's just the sugar that they're adding it's it's it just you know it's a Budweiser essentially you're just drinking a you know a great version of Budweiser you know and I you know, for those that drink Budweiser, no offense, you know, they do have consistency as producing a product that tastes the same no matter where they brew it, in, in whatever brewery they're doing it. But, uh, you know, when you're talking about something like this, it's it's vastly different than, say, you're drinking an Apothic. Or in this case, a Vernaccia that I've had years ago was from a bigger producer at twice the price, and it didn't even show this kind of character. And I can remember it to this day. And, uh, only because, you know, there was one sales guy that hit the whole shoreline and a bunch of us had tasted it and we all had different comments to make about it. You know, it was, you know, it was expensive. It was highly rated, but it was like, yeah, but it, it didn't live up to that standard. It was just not what you would, you know, where it should be. Um, yeah. This is beautiful. Yeah. Wine. I mean, for the price point this is at, it's ridiculous. Uh, John, a lot of character. What's that? Oh, no, I was going to, I was going to ask John a question when you, when you get a second. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. The, the, the process of this, John, because I know we have another, we have a French producer that does something similar to this. Would you say this costs a lot of money or would you say it's pretty, it's probably good for the land, obviously. It's good yeah. for it's good for the viticulture. But how how many, I don't know if you could say how many days would it take or how many weeks, but probably years to do this successfully. Uh, how many you know years would you say it took to, to kind of get in this rhythm of doing this? It's, it's a huge process to, to farm biodynamically, um, to farm organically too, but, but especially biodynamically. Um, and it's always more expensive. It's always going to be a, a significantly higher cost, um, which is always one of those things that that's, that's showing, up, showing why um, people are going for these because it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a sound financial investment to, to make biodynamic wine. It's, it's an incredible investment to do that. And it costs way more. You make way less doing it, um, but it, it's a better thing. And it takes it takes a long time um, because I mean Italy's Italy's a little bit easier because they've had a, a longer tradition of these you know these vineyards being well maintained and well cared for. Um, but all it takes is you know you know a, a sort of five year run of someone using sort of uh, generic pesticides and stuff in uh, in a farm to really necessitate almost a, a decade of having to revive the soil um, and bring it back. These guys have been, uh, they've been on the, the biodynamic train. They've been, they've been producing wines like this um, for just over 30 years. So they've been really uh, deep in this since before it was on trend actually. Um, and it, it's, it's a process. I mean, now they're, now they've got it down. Um, you know, they've got it down pat and they do a wonderful job, but even just to give you this context, of the three wines we've had tonight, this is the smallest production by far. Um, this is the one wine of these that usually we are guaranteed to sell out before the end of the summer. And actually we're just about to sell out right now. It was a little later this year because all the restaurants weren't closed. Um, but this wine that we're tasting right now, there's only 20,000 bottles made for the entire world. Um, America's getting a, a fraction of that. My company's getting very, very little of that. Um, but so that's, that's when you're, when you're taking that down, I mean, that's, it's some hundreds of cases, but that's not, uh, when you put that into context up against other producers that have, you know, thousands and thousands, 20,000 cases, as opposed to 20,000 bottles, right. Right. um, this is, this is really tiny production. So there's a lot more care that's gone into it and a lot more cost that's gone into it as well, which is why it's awesome to be able to get it at not a crazy price. No, right. And that's uh, every, every factor you listed for this thing. And it still comes in under $20. I mean, yeah. the care that went into this wine 
and the you know yeah. the volume of production on this, and it's still under twenty dollars. Uh, I mean, Kendall Jackson can't touch this. They're they're not even twenty thousand bottles is is what a, a couple days on their assembly line. <laughs> that, that, that's one day on the bottling line. Right, one day on the bottling line. They're not even concerned about that. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that you know their their quality is consistent for what they want. Again, it, it's just. It's two different dynamics here when you're trying to get yeah, 100%. It's people. it's just it's it's yeah, it's different different uh different worlds. Different worlds. And and you're tasting this thing, you're like, "Wow, this is incredible. This is under $20." And there's yeah. just been so much thought put into this wine. It's it blows your mind. And you're walking away from this and like, "My god, I, I you know, this is just incredible wine." And just to go back to changing and evolving in the bottle over years, I mean, that this is another wine where I feel like this has already changed a little. I tasted this early on in the summer when we first brought it to you, Chris. I think it's already changed and evolved from that. So it gives you an, it gives you an idea of you could buy a bottle in, in early June and if you crack it open end of August or early September, it might be different than what you what you tried, uh, you know, early June, which is what you're getting from these these single vineyard properties right. like but this. Just what Jason again, what Jason's saying. Let's put a note on that. Uh, this is young still. This is a baby. 2019, yeah, this is nice yeah. fresh. You know, yeah, yeah this is going to evolve. So you come back to this at like December, January, you go into January with this, it's going to be very different. Not bad, but it's just going to keep evolving. Again, there's some rosés that are that just came to market in late July, August for us to sell retail. And in Connecticut, it's kind of a gray area to start bringing in new rosé at that time. But they haven't even evolved yet. You know, and they're presenting them to us. It's like, wow. And when you try them early in the season, it's, it tastes one way and it's not ready. When you taste them, you know, come September, October, now they're starting to come into their own. That's very common. Uh, so um, even with this, as good as it's tasting now, I, I can't wait to try this come December, January, see what this thing really can do, you know, what, what kind of legs it's going to have. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an awesome wine to see evolve um, as it gets older and as it really comes into itself. Um, I think it starts to really flesh out a lot and starts to round out you still get all that wonderful spice on the nose that really chalkiness on the palate yeah um but it really starts sort of uh rounding out what do you guys think of it what's the uh what's the opinion on this guy yeah put in some comments in the chat room there or unmute yourself what would you cook with this what kind of food would you pair with this Ooh, I mean, that's, get, what's yeah. that that's interesting i don't even know i'm trying to think of what like the best food i would pair with this right now i mean I, i'm throwing this back to like Southern Maine Colin. I mean, it's got that body to it. It's got that white pepper to it. You know, if you're talking like, if you like Chardonnay from like Southern part of Burgundy, it picks up similar qualities. It's got similar weight to that. Yeah. I'm getting that white pepper. Sorry. What's that? We love it. It's lovely. Good. It's the best oh, one great. That's what it's there for. Enjoy it. Fantastic. All of us sit here, we can pontificate over wine, and, you know, we often do, and it, it's not to sound pretentious or anything, but we geek out on stuff like this. But just bring it down to its, you know, basic, you know, uh, descriptors and everything. It comes down to what do you like about this, number one all the way. But three was really good as well, yeah. 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 I like that. Yeah. And this is what I, I love. To, this is one of my favorite things to see is I love to see everyone say what was their favorite because you never have – you know, I'd almost hate it if everyone loved one particular, like if the whole crowd here, all 15 of you, all love one. I want everyone to have different opinions because every wine is going to strike a different chord with someone else. Everyone's going to love something else and have a different favorite. Um, and that's the best thing to say. Yeah. Um, but what, what's the classic food pairing with this? What would you do? I mean, I could get into some something like pork. Pork with this would be phenomenal. So if you're looking mm -hmm. for a wine to pair, you know, if you want to do a white wine with uh, a meat dish, you could definitely do pork with this. Chicken thighs, anything. You know, nice. I, I think, I mean, uh, pork, definitely chicken thighs. I, hit, I think you hit the nail right in the head. I'm, uh, I'm very simple for this and it's not even super traditional, but I just roast chicken all the way. Roast just, chicken, you know, yeah. whole roast chicken, uh, you know, root vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this wine's absolutely awesome. Uh, if you want to get really fun, uh, rabbit with this, any yeah. kind of, um, either braised rabbit done the same way as you can do. Um, chicken thighs. I always encourage anyone to try um, either ordering or cooking rabbit um, if you have the ability because if you like chicken, you'll absolutely uh, go nuts for rabbit. And that's that's definitely traditional. 
when you start talking Central Italy, um, and the wines show beautiful. I did. There we go. See, someone was just saying rabbit. That's we're we're on a we're on a psychic kick right now. We all yeah. like it. <laughs> no, I I when I was in culinary school, we had to do rabbit. Uh, again, you know, it, it's a shocker for uh, you know a culinary student to be cooking thumper, but uh, at the end of at the end of the day, you know, once we got done braising it with everything, uh, it was fantastic. I mean, again, it, it goes right back to like, you know, chicken thighs. That's the same kind yeah, of flavor exactly. profile. Uh, exactly. Fatty, you know, uh, absolutely delicious. But we, we, were, thinking with, like, uh, we were thinking like a, a sausage, broccoli rabe, and orchetti would be really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Jump jump into something like that. A little, a little orchette with sausage and broccoli rabe like that. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think the herbaceousness in this will cut through that bitterness on the broccoli rob. Mm -hmm. so the there's enough acid on this vegetables. that it cuts through the fat of the sausage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sauteed vegetables, just a hint of soy sauce, just a hint of soy sauce, a little bit of just to zang it up a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Go yeah, for think, it. Yeah, no, just don't think like Italian cuisine or anything. You know, move it over, make it international. What else can you pair this with? Uh, I mean, I've done pairings. There's a, you know, I, I'm trying to get these guys down there. Uh, there's a Thai restaurant in, uh, in New Haven. I've done Italian wines with this cuisine, and it works. You can do it. Uh, so don't don't just box yourself into one country. Take it out of there and see what else you can mix and match with this wine because you can do it. Uh, it's very versatile. Uh, just to yeah, I mean that's out. that's the beauty of that's the beauty of a lot of these Italian whites, anyways. That they 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 really can go with so many different things. I mean, there is literally no wrong answers here because. Um, you know, everyone's got uh, different tastes and what you like. And these wines are so food friendly. They've all got that, that acidity, all that minerality on the back end. It makes them just gorgeous wines to do with anything you want. So that's, that's the beauty of it. You know, you grab these wines, you, you start experimenting, make whatever you want for dinner, try them out, uh, mess around with them. You're, you're nine out of 10 times bound to find a pretty cool pair. No, I really are. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Experiment. Uh, there's no right and wrong when it's in your own kitchen. Again, if you're asking us, we're going to give you, you know, between just the three of us, we're going to give you three vastly different opinions. You might find some commonality with the three of us, but uh, it, it comes down to the person. Uh, we all encourage you to really seek out different matches and pairings when you're cooking at home. It, it comes down to what you like. Uh, even with yeah. cheeses, something like this, you could definitely do like a pecorino. Uh, yep. you know, what grows oh. together goes together. This comes from Siena. So I'm thinking, uh, Pecorino di Pienza uh, would go great with this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you leave it out a little bit, that oil comes out, starts coming out of it, and the salinity starts coming out of it. It'd be great with that. Hold right up to that. Something aged like that would be great. John, yeah. 2019 was a good, was, was, would you say is a good vintage for them? 19 was great. 19 was, 19 was fantastic. Um, everyone's, everyone's really, really happy. Um, this was a fun, it, it was a fun vintage because we were able to kind of, uh, you know, we were able to kind of moderate. I mean, let's face it. We had, we had so much, we had so much free time in the earlier half of the year, um, on sort of the, the, the wine importing side because everything was so frozen that we were able to just, we were, you know, we were doing video calls with our producers every week and talking to them and asking how the wines had, you know, from the 19s had, had shaped up, how they were doing on the cellar, they were getting ready to release them to us. Um, and we got to here and 19 was, 19 was a really cool one too. You had a little more warmth here. So a little bit more ripeness. Um, but these are, these are fun wines, fun vintage. Yeah. I just made a comment. I mean, if you try this wine ice cold, if it just came out of your fridge, uh, I try to put some instructions in the emails that go home for tonight. Uh, especially now. I mean, this wine's been out for about an hour for me. Very different, very different. Totally, to very totally different. different on this one. I mean, I've, I've shown this wine, um, you know, at the, the first stop of the day, you know, you, you take this wine out of the bag and it's, it's ice cold from the ice packs and everything. And it's like the perfect oyster wine. It's lean because it doesn't, it's not showing any of that body yet. So you get all this chalky acidity and minerality and almost this like lemons curd zest thing coming right in through the back. Uh, and it's outstanding and it makes you want to, you know, makes you want to order a shellfish tower and jump into this. And now, I mean, my, my bottle here is, uh, you know, it's come to pretty close to room temperature. It's warmed up quite a bit. The wine just gets so much rounder and fatter. And now I'm, now I'm you know, we're talking chicken thighs, rabbit. That's, that's where the wine's hitting now. Um, so that's a really fun thing about, about this wine as well. 
you know, a lot of white peppers coming out of it right now on the back end on the fish. You know? It's it's when you talk about a wine with layers of flavor, and you might hear us throw those terms around as we're describing a wine. If you read my emails, I'll tell you this wine's got layers on top of layers of flavor, uh, like an onion. You just keep peeling back all these different characteristics of it. As this yeah. thing evolves, just even within your glass over the course of your meal, it's going to be very different from the time you start dinner to the time you finish dinner with that last glass. It's going to change constantly, and yeah. uh, and that and that's the sign of that's the sign of good winemaking. That's the sign of a good winemaker and, and great vineyards. Um, is that it's that complexity and that it's the the wine's not just. Uh, one note. It's not just you're, you're, you're hearing this and done. You know, a really great wine should be like a, a full-on classical piece. You have everything coming into itself. The wine's rising and falling and and really uh, showing so many different layers. As you said, Chris, that's that's the sign of a really well-made wine um, and just a wine from a, a, a really authentic wine with, with a real sort of purity and sense of place. No, oh, big time. This nails it. This nails it. I can't tell you how much character this wine has and again i just keep going back to it under twenty dollars that's not a sales pitch i'm not going to give you a free slap chop with this uh it's just it's just a great wine it's a well-made wine uh, a lot of care went into this thing and i'm we're just spending a lot of time on that because i, I want you to really take value in what was presented to you tonight especially on the finish this was a great finisher i'm glad you put this on the end because it, it's worth paying that much attention to uh it's just so much going on with this wine. And again, I tasted this with you guys and I loved it. I brought it in and, and tonight I'm sitting here sipping on it and it, it's just, it's blowing my mind. Each time I go to the glass with it, I, I'm in love with this wine. I just, it's fantastic. Good job. My Good roommate, job. my roommate just tasted all three of them. And the, the first one he, he liked, uh, he loved. And then the, he tasted that last one and he right. goes, whoa. And yeah. that was his huh. reaction was just, whoa. And that's yeah. it kind of gives you an idea of, I think that's what happened a lot with this, with these wines. The next one you, you pop the cork and you're just like, wow, they're, it's yeah. something completely different. So, yeah. So everybody in the chat, in the uh, audience tonight, you can unmute yourself now or open it up. Any questions, any comments, please send them out to us. Uh, before yeah. we do that, I want to thank John so much. I want to thank Jason so much coming out on our Friday night, uh, taking the time really to walk us all through this. It's uh, For me, it's been a great tasting and I appreciate it tremendously what they do for us. Uh, so everybody give them a round of applause. If you can, we can't hear everybody, but you know, if you got on mute, you know, clap loud so we can all hear you. Yeah, <laughs> good, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me apart. And, and thank you, Chris, because Chris does a, such a wonderful job putting these things together. I mean, he really goes the, the extra mile in doing these. Um, and these are really some of the, the, the best online tastings and even his in-store tastings, they're just, they're really masterfully done and, and well done. So. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you do them. I'm glad you, you have our wines um, for them. But please, anyone who's got... I'm happy to uh, represent them in the store. I mean, I, I honestly just love these wines. Everything that they bring to us has been gold. So, again, if you're not with me, if you're not shopping with me, and I, you know, I get it. Uh, look on the back of the bottle. It's like a cheat sheet, although you should be shopping with me because I deliver it. Uh, so, look on the back of the bottle. That's a cheat sheet for you. If you're anywhere and you don't, you're kind of unsure, you don't really, you know, you're, you may be on vacation, you may be just somewhere passing through, you want to get a bottle of wine for the night, look at the back of the bottle. If it's, if it's Italian, look for that Vias insignia on it. Just yeah. grab it. I mean, don't even question it. You see Vias on there, grab it. It's going to be golden. I'm telling you right now. And that's, I can say that about a bunch of different producers in different parts of the world. When you look on the back of that bottle, you see that their insignia, their name, grab it. It's 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 gonna be a home run nine times out of ten. And that's that's that, those are good odds. Uh, and what these guys bring to us is just it's just great every time. Uh, it, it's hard to pick. Everybody asks, well, how do you choose the wine? It's it's hard. You know, uh, it's about what our customers are looking for, uh, the demand for it, you know, obviously the price range. Uh, but the other end of it is to expose you, everybody to these wines. So doing these classes and with their help, you know, really exposing people to these wines just because I can't stand walking into anywhere. And I'm a consumer like everybody else in this audience tonight and beyond. Uh, I go to other places, not because I'm snooping, 
It's because I want to be a consumer. I want to be sold to on my day off. And if I walk into a store, I see 25 different Pinot Grigios. I want to blow my brains out because there's, there's so much more to Italy than just Pinot Grigio and Prosecco. There are, again, we said it before, there are great ones out there. It doesn't matter what price range you're in. There's, there's great wines in each price range you want to be in. Hey, Chris. Go ahead. Chris, these are really good wines. Yeah. I like the distinct, different regions and flavors of each one. I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course, Vernaccia was always my favorite for years. Vernaccia is always your favorite. Why do you think I bring this thing in for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my family loved the Gavi, which I have to say ah. was excellent. The Gavi was excellent, yes. So, oh, I mean, Paula, Paula, when she does her classes in store, that's the first wine she recommends, Vernaccia, Vernaccia San Gimignano. And, it's true. you know, it's like a 50-50. If I have one that I really like that I want to bring in, I'm like, you know what? These guys came in with one. I'm like, yeah, I got to bring this in. This thing's great. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Like the price. No, but the, my family's asking me about the price points of these wines. Do you talk about that during these tastings at all? Uh, I usually don't just because uh, no? okay. price price should okay. reflect quality. Uh, it has a lot to do okay. with production and everything else, but yes. uh, don't let Sorry. price lead anybody no, I, for you. To, no, um, I know your prices are. Yeah, uh, I think this one's at 16 in the store. Again, don't quote me on that. It's on the app. If you have the app, uh, Wine 101 yep. Hamden, uh, you can see everything on there. But I think it's around 16. Uh, and don't quote okay. me on that. If you come back to me tomorrow no, and say, no. well, it's 18, no, come no. on now. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't take well, I think I, I think the, the, the overarching thing is, I mean, these wines, the three of them, the, the price, and I, I say that as, as purely a consumer and, and not the guy who sells them, but right. um, I think they are priced pretty uh, fairly, and that's the fun of these, these different regions in Italy right. and, and these different smaller producers is being able to find um, – awesome quality for, for, you know, less than your, say your, your, you know, $20 big producer on the shelf. Uh, yeah. All of these come under that. Um, no, so. I, they're high quality wines. They're excellent. Yeah. But they're, they're like people who believe you can't get a good bottle of wine for less than $50 or like, like around $50. So I don't believe that to be true. No, 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 no. There's, there's, there's wonderful wines to be found I, from, I, you know, I, I really hesitate to put a, I, I think, I think $10 and up, you can find awesome, between 10 and 20, you have awesome things you can find I between, can play around. yeah, there's, there's yeah. so much you can do. It's all about, you know, it, it really is. It's about talking to guys like Chris, uh, talking to guys like Jason, talking to guys like um, myself and ask, because this is, this is literally what we spend all of our time doing. <laughs> we do, we talk about wine, we taste wine. Um, and we get into it, so we have we have plenty to, to say on the subject and plenty to recommend because there's there's fun stuff to be found. No, and th this is the chain right here. It comes down from John and it presents it to Jason. Jason comes in with me, you know, it comes to me with John, uh, and that's how we do this. That's that's the whole three, literally almost a three tier system here, how it works in Connecticut, um, and it, it's just when when our salespeople understand what we're looking for and how we want to deliver to our consumers, you know, the customer, uh, when they get it, they get it. And they, they just continuously show us mm -hmm. these wines again, just what he said between 10 and $20. That's a huge, huge playground for anybody like me, uh, to find all these gems. And if you, yep. you know, even when you subscribe to our wines of the month, uh, last month we featured a lot of John's wines, you know, we featured two of them just because they were incredible, incredible values for the money. And to yeah. put a wine at $9, people would question it. And uh, I found that out a lot when we came, when we first opened, people would question it. Again, it has a lot to do with not knowing the buyer and, you know, you know, we were very new to people. Uh, but I think over the years, people trust us. And if I showed you a wine for $10, $11, even $9, you would say, yeah, I'm taking it because, you know, you trust our faith in that wine and that Stati Bianco has been crushing it for us. It, it's a fantastic wine from Calabria. Again, I, anybody that's looking for a, a crushable white wine to just pour for people to enjoy, that's the one to go to. Although, although I just brought in that Cortesi and that's going to take over. And, I, I mean, and, and you can't, you can't argue with that. Either. Oh, so yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day and you know, I, I can, 
don't only speak for myself here, but look, I, I'm, I'm a wine importer, but I'm a wine drinker first yeah. and foremost. And I'm not trying to spend a ton of money on when I'm buying wine for myself. Um, and I very, very rarely do spend, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm very rarely spending a ton of money on wine. I find a lot of stuff um, in that, that 10 to 20 area. And that's, that's, that's where I yeah. drink all the time. That's, that's my ideal playground because there's so much to find in there, you know? No, there really is. Yeah. It doesn't matter what country you're in. I mean, uh, United States gets tough, but uh, you know when you're out of, when you're out of here, it's it's there's a playground to be had. Uh, the big sandbox to go play in, and uh, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to share this with you all, and that's the most important part: sharing it with you all. Uh, some people don't get a window into this world, and I always uh, use the analogy when I taught at a college, and a lot of the college kids would ask me, the students would ask me. Uh, you know, what does a hundred dollar bottle taste like and is it worth it? And by the end of the semester, as we're tasting wines like you all are doing, uh, you know, I bring something from my my cellar for them to taste, something, you know, of, of substance, of you know, a uh, big price tag. And uh they knew, they knew that this wine was substantially different, but does that really make an impact in you and say, Wow, I'm gonna go out and buy this? No, you sit there and say, Yeah, I understand there's value in this wine when you taste something like that. But you know what? All the wines we've been tasting up until here, I would play in that area. I would play in that sandbox all the time. There's great stuff to be had. So when you come into the store, you want to buy that magic bottle. It's going to impress everybody for $100. I could show you four or five wines. You know, five wines for $20 always impresses me. You know, it really does. Uh, <laughs> and that's where I like to play because there's great stuff on there. And you're tasting them all tonight. really are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, everybody, give these guys a round of applause for taking their time tonight on Friday night to do this for us. So, again, uh, give Thank a Thank you, clap. everyone. Appreciate everyone coming. Yeah, shaker, you know, hold up your glass, salute them. Um, <laughs> from myself, from Carol, gentlemen, thank you so much for doing this tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, if you all don't have any more comments or questions, please toss them out there before we go. Uh, we're happy to we're happy to talk as you can see between Chris and Jason and myself we can talk about wine until the until the wee hours oh. so we are we're we, happy we to answer any any questions or any discussion we did that the last class we did we with did John do that the last time. Jason had to go early I think uh but John and I went out for like two and a half hours so yeah we kept we can make this all night I'll just stop the recording so I don't use up my uh bandwidth here but uh no to all you out in the audience, we appreciate the support tremendously. Uh, again, not just for us, but for these properties, for these people that joined us tonight. Uh, they represent the wines just phenomenally. Uh, and it takes people like you to go out there in the world and again, go to a restaurant. And if it's not on the list, if you really love these wines, and this is the key, if you love these wines, start asking for them at your favorite restaurant. Go in there and say, you know what? I tried this Vernaccia San Gimignano and tell them the name, show them the picture, say, this was really good. I think this would go great with your cuisine. Once you start talking up stuff like that, restaurateurs sit there and say, you know what? I need to get that. Where can I get that? And they make the call to guys like Jason, to John, say, hey, somebody's been talking about this wine. And that's how you see it at your favorite restaurant. And likewise, it works in reverse too. I had this wine at a restaurant. People come in to me and I say, yeah, I'll try. I'll give it a shot. I'll call these guys and say, Hey, what's up with this wine? You know, so and so is pouring it at the restaurant. What do you think? And they bring it down to me. We try it, and you know, it, we give it consideration. So yeah, it works both ways. So be vocal. If you really like something, you want to see it somewhere, uh, tell them. Tell them. Take the picture of the wine. Show it to them. You know, start requesting it, and you know, see everybody sees what they can do with it, and uh, hopefully, we put more wines like this into people's hands. That's the whole that's the whole purpose of doing classes like this. So again, yeah. for myself, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Cheers to you all. Have a great yes. weekend. Enjoy yes. Thank you all so much for coming out. Cheers, everybody.